So for those that don't know me, that's probably pretty good. Uh, I'm John Holloway from DOD DISA, and I'm working with um, the transport, PEO transport on HF. We have Brian McCarty here from the Joint Tactical Network Center. Uh, he's doing a lot of stuff at the technical level. And I'm up at the uh, strategic level doing uh, communications agreements. I'm also the D, uh, DOD director for the uh, Global Office of the Global Public Safety Comms Modernization Effort. So, what I like to point out is this little chart over here called Morse code. Does anybody remember how to do Morse code? Oh, we got one, two, three in the back, all the way in the back. You just walk and he's hiding behind the curtains. So yesterday I was over at the Marine booth and they had this sign up there that said, U.S. Marine Corps Communications Training. And so I went and I asked the staff sergeant, I says, do you know what an R390, a speed key and a one-time pad is? And he looked at me with this funny look on his face. So I can remember R390 with the serial number of five. So that may tell you how old I might be. So what we want to do is talk about the role of DISA in the HF community. And as you all probably know, HF is coming back with a vengeance. It's kind of like a cancer. You know, you get rid of cancer the first time and you think you're good. The second time you're dead in about three months. So it's coming back like a cancer. Brian is, like I mentioned, working a lot of the technical stuff. Um, as you can see right here, DISA is responsible for the formal international communications agreements with the Five Eyes community. Okay, what does that mean? So DISA Transport, PEO Transport, has international agreements with our Five Eyes members. And up until about two years ago, I was looking at just DISA circuits, the regular DISA circuits, be it Nipper or Sipper. And all of a sudden, I said, well, let's add HF to that. So we're doing that. So in that aspect, we're coming up with communications agreements. And within those communications agreements, we're writing SOPs for the 5i members to access the DOD HFGCS network. Okay, if you don't know what that is, you can Google it, but in short, it's 13 high-powered HF sites scattered across the globe. We also have them coming into various HF events, much like Bold Quest. Okay, so there is a special HF thread in Bold Quest, and Brian's going to get into that in a little bit because what they're doing on the technical side. Um, we're also looking at high-speed HF or wideband HF, however you want to call it. And then access to uh, JITIC for HF testing. So we're working those issues. Um, what we want to do, this is also with the Emergency Technologies Directorate. Um, they have a requirement from Southcom and the Marine Corps to develop a capability called nipper sipper in a box. So on the front end, I can connect it to a SATCOM link, and on the back end, I can connect it to HF. Or I can, where we can send traffic, both on class and class, back and forth. We're also looking at link 22 and how to pass that more efficiently over HF. Back up one. There we go. No, one more. Back up. 
So part of, part of um, the HF part is the uh, Mars system, both Army and Air Force. And this is a cartoon depicting um, what they're doing. So we have the uh, National Command Authority, HFDF uh, networks coming down into Mars. Mars is about 3,000 volunteers across the globe. Um, then we have uh, JCS-2 uh, TAC-23, uh, DODI-4650.02. Here we have, to our Canadian friend over here, we have CFARs. We work with CFARs a lot. Um, in fact, some of the CFAR stations are about as big as some of our HFGCS sites, especially up in uh, British Columbia. We have federal agencies. Um, let's go to DHS Shares. This is a uh, Homeland Security Shares Network that comes active every so often. Uh, we're picking up um, federal agencies. There is now a federal HF working group. And what's happened is that the director of the FBI has told his communication system or sector rejuvenate my HF network. So the, the uh, FBI is working on uh, rejuvenating their HF network. Um, let's see what else we got. Okay, we have NORTHCOM. NORTHCOM has a HF network to go out to their various components. Um, we already talked about HFGCS, uh, Mars patch, uh, phone patch, Mars Radio. Then we have uh, others down in here. So these are the mission authorities. Um, it talks to basically Mars members. And I believe these slides are going to be available out on the FCA website probably in a week for you to download. Next. These are upcoming HF exercises for this year. Uh, we got one coming up at the end of this month. Then we have the, uh, this is low power. You can't, you're not supposed to transmit over 20 watts. Then we have the Armed Forces Day crossband. So on the crossband, what that does is that there are five frequencies in the 60 meter band. They're all on five megs. It allows DOD and federal agencies to talk to the amateur community without having to get an amateur radio license. So let's say I'm on the USS Nimitz and I want to talk to a amateur radio operator. I'm sitting, say, in Norfolk or out here. So I can go up on one of those five meter frequencies or 60 meter frequencies, five megs, and use my Essex call sign and contact a amateur radio operator. So like when we had uh, did a Hurricane Maria, Okay, Hurricane Maria took out the undersea uh, ISP, the Internet Service uh, Portal for U.S. Virgin Islands. They had no way to communicate except via AHF, but they couldn't get back to the states. They didn't have enough power. So the Essex was out there, and I got a hold of uh, fleet forces, and the six there got a hold of the ship, the C-5I on the ship, and so they contacted the Emergency Operations Center of U.S. Virgin Islands, and they started passing traffic of what they needed back to FEMA via HF. Uh, we have various COMEXs. We have Bold Quest, like I mentioned. And then we have the uh, Canadian uh, International HF competition called Exercise Noble Skywave. Last year, there were 26 nations in it around the world, anywhere from Dubai down to Uruguay, um, over into uh, Taiwan. 
So it's, you get so many points for making contacts and so forth and so on. Next slide. Now we're going to go to the um, Indopaycom, to the uh, Multinational Communications Interoperability Program. This has members from the Pacific Rim. Uh, usually there's 17 to 22 of them uh, participating at any given time. They're looking at using various radios, Codans, Harris, Barrett. Those are the ones I can come off the top of my head. And it's to foster mill-to-mill, -mill, mill to civilian relationships. Um, they're looking at testing of the interoperability on a less formal um, program than what JTNC is doing. They're talking uh, skill sets, uh, cyber, going over spectrum. In fact, I just got a uh, request from Paycom J6 from um, the country of Brunei for some HF uh, work and uh, spectrum issues. So it establishes interoperability and basically it's for HADR. Next slide. So Pacific Endeavor is their communications exercise. It's held in different countries uh, within the Pacific area. They have a couple planning shops and those are held in different countries as well before they conduct the exercise. So um, going back to 2015, we did, no, 2014, we did an exercise in Kathmandu and it was on an earthquake, and it was a 7.5 earthquake. Well, nine months later, they had a 7.0 earthquake, if anybody remembers it. So a lot of what we did nine months earlier was used during that earthquake. So that's where the training comes in. Because as you all know, you just can't hand a HF radio over to Joe Small and say, make it work. It doesn't work like that. Next slide, please. So this is um, Pacific Endeavor, and IPRN stands for Indo-Pacific Relief Network. And you can see on here who they were talking to, uh, passing traffic back and forth, and they are also using 2 and 3G ALE, uh, as well as uh, data and voice. So you can, it's 12 countries, and they're all around the Pacific Rim. Next, please. So it's... So like the yellow, if you can't read this, and you can see the yellow lines, that is single channel voice. The green lines is ALE, automatic link uh, establishment. So you see those colors and you can see what they're doing. And it's all going into um, Oahu. And Oahu's up here. And I think they had some stuff going down on another island. And JCSE was up on Oahu doing it. Next slide. This is just a different diagram of what you saw previously. So you have, on this one, we have the Philippines in the top right. Uh, Brunei, Bangladesh, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, Fiji, uh, New Caledonia under French, uh, Moffat Airfield, and San Jose. And then this is on Hawaii at uh, Waiwa. That's, this is a depiction of the Waiwa antenna, which is kind of unique. 
Next slide. Again, a summary of the different number of tests that were conducted. Um, so there are 311 tests, 271 uh, single channel voice, and then you had the French stations, and then they were talking to a NMCC. If you don't know what that is, in disaster language, that's the Multinational uh, Communication Center. The uh, UN OCHA will set that up at different areas depending upon uh, if uh, OCHA has been called into play or not. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, we have NORTHCOM with their components and they are active in DHS shares uh, which uh, meets on the air, I want to say uh, at least once a month. We have the HFGCS sites. Six and a half are owned by Navy. Six and a half are owned by Air Force. And they can go up to 25 kW. Civil Air Patrol has, what, 2,200 HF radios or base stations around the US. They usually link up with um, DHS. Uh, DH, and then the next one is DHS uh, shares. Like I mentioned, the uh, FBI. And then under the uh, Emergency Communication Preparedness Center, um, you have the Federal HF Working Group and HF and Supported uh, Public Safety Comms. So in the state of California, Cal OES, is building communication vans which have HF, VHF, um, LMR, and some other things on it. State of Virginia Emergency Management is doing the same thing in the Tidewater area. So that way if something happens in the Tidewater area and they have to sort the ships out, then the state of Virginia can come up on one of those 60 meter frequencies and then talk to the ships and tell them what's happening ashore. Uh, even though they're getting on the news, they'd be getting more accurate information from the Virginia Emergency Management folks. Next slide. Any questions on this part of the presentation? So what I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Brian, and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about what JTNC's doing. All right, so good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian McCarty. Everybody hear me good? This starts to drop a little bit. I'll just talk louder. Well, not necessarily a big fan of holding the mic. Um, <clears throat> so I represent the, uh, the Joint Tactical Networking Center. Uh, we are based out of here in uh, Point Loma, San Diego. Uh, here today is our director, uh, Mr. Reese. Um, kind of want to talk a little bit about what the JTNC does uh, in support of uh, DOD HF activities. Um, as well as what we're doing uh, to support uh, the overall warfighter. Um, as, as John mentioned earlier, HF is making a, a very big resurgence um, within, uh, within not only the DOD, uh, but also our, our partner and coalition nations. Um, so <clears throat> we chair uh, what's called the, the Department of Defense HF Interoperability and Architecture Subworking Group. Uh, I've been chairing that for co-chairing and chairing for about five years now. Um, and, and really our big focus has been on uh, next generation HF waveforms. As John mentioned a little bit, uh, some of the automatic link establishments, um, some of the wideband HF, uh, really trying to take a look at, uh, at, at what the DOD is currently using, um, what the DOD is gonna use in the future, uh, and how do we mesh those different requirements from the different services uh, and different mission areas together uh, to enable interoperability cross-platform, inter-service, intra-service, uh, as well as interoperability with our, uh, our coalition and partner nations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we started out uh, kind of hopping into the, the, the Joint Staff J6 Bold Quest exercises, uh, the HF threads, uh, back in about 2021. Uh, the Joint Staff J6 reached out to our, our subordinate group and said, hey, uh, a Collins radio and a Harris radio can't communicate. Not much information, um, but we said, okay. Uh, we were already kind of working a, a, a new program for the Air Force uh, that included some of the, the next generation HF, uh, HF waveforms. 
um, which was the fourth generation automatic link establishment, uh, as well as YBIN HF. Does anybody know what YBIN HF is? Other than the folks that I know in this room know what YBIN HF is? All right, so YBIN HF is a, is a standard, uh, mil standard 188, 110 delta. Uh, so a, a normal HF channel, right, is, is three kilohertz, right? So we take 16 contiguous three kilohertz channels, we put them together all the way up to 48 kilohertz uh, as per the standard. Now, anything technically over three kilohertz is designated as a wideband HF channel, um, but for the purposes of what we're testing uh, in, the, in the next generation HF waveforms, uh, we're looking out to 48 kilohertz um, contiguous, right? There's also a, a non-contiguous, it's a different Stan Ag, um, standard NATO agreement. Uh, we, we don't play around with that much. Um, that, that's a NATO thing that we're not into. Um, but for the purposes of what we were looking at in Bull Quest 2020, uh, we focused on the fourth generation wideband ALE and also wideband HF. Uh, so we pulled Harris and Collins in together in one room uh, over there at, at JITC. Uh, so when I used to work at, uh, at JITC. Um, and we went, sat down with the mill standard author, went over almost all the requirements in the 488 pages in, in each of the two standards uh, that we were working with. Um, and we actually got L3 Harris and Collins Aerospace to link in 4G wideband HF and actually pass some, uh, some, some data, some basic 110 data uh, using a bit error rate tester. Um, so that was a, a first of its kind. Uh, so the next year's bold quest rolled around and we said, uh, well, let's, let's go for the gusto. We did, we did two vendors just at the, at the request of joint shaft stage six. So we did a lot of, uh, done a little research um, and looked at you know, which particular vendors out there uh, in the HF market have uh, 4G whale and wideband HF capabilities and we're able to pull in five. Um, so, and the, these exercises, uh, demonstrations more like, uh, they usually last about a week, right? So we do, the first day is dedicated to kind of setup introductions and really going over the mill standard with the, uh, with the author. Um, and then we get about three and a half days in the lab. And then we roll right into a kind of a, a hot wash on the last day to kind of discuss, uh, you know, what was observed, um, successes. Uh, one of the benefits that comes out of these exercises is we're actually able to clarify language within the mill standard. I don't know if you all, how many of y'all have ever read a mill standard, right? If you need some good sleeping material, go ahead and uh, dive into a mill standard. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but all of us in this room could read a mill standard and we could all interpret it, you know, 40 different ways, right? Which means vendors and engineers who, and no offense to any engineers in here, tend to overthink things, right? They can interpret it uh, different ways too. So that really can impact our warfighter. We have a standard, right? and a piece of equipment has said, okay, it, it conforms to this standard, right? But it's all about how you interpret it. So that's what we saw across five different vendors. We started out the event with two vendors already interoperable um, to certain parameters, right? Very strict parameters in Collins and L3 Harris from the years prior, uh, but nobody else could talk with Collins and L3 Harris. Uh, at the end of the event, um, we actually ran two sessions that year. Um, the first session was, was, let's get the physical layer down, let's get the waveform uh, and the protocols for the data down um, between Wideband HF and, uh, and 4G Whale. Um, and then on top of that, we got introduced to the ISODE folks over here um, who came out and gave us a demo of their, uh, their chat and email Stan Ag 5066 um, application. So we, we kind of pushed it on the vendors. We said, uh, all right, go make this happen too. Implement 5066 on top of it. Uh, so at the end of that, so these were both one week with engineers from each of the representatives uh, from the vendors in there. Uh, by the end of that, we had five vendors sending chat and email uh, over wideband HF in a 4G wideband ALE link, right? Which sounds great and it was a huge success, but I will lay the disclaimer, that's not something that's field ready, right? That's not something we can push out in the field and the fleet um, and our warfighters can use it. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done with that. Uh, but it was laying the foundation for what our sub working group focus on interoperability and architecture uh, was going to do for the foreseeable future. As we can see that, that the warfighters need that support, right? We want to make sure we're putting out interoperable comms for our warfighter. Um, fast forward to, to, I guess, last year's Bold Quest in uh, summer of 2023, uh, we ended up pulling 14 vendors together. Um, we kind of took a step back and said, all right, the 4G whale and the wideband HF, uh, while it's, it's, it's mature enough for us to get five to link, um, and pass some data. We want to take a step back and, uh, and look at what's out there field in the fleet and the field 
um, and really we focused on the, the third generation automatic radio control system, uh, which is otherwise known as 3G ALE. And for any of the, the green suitors uh, out here, uh, your PRC 160s, right? They're running 3G ALE. Um, so we pulled 14 vendors in, and within a week, uh, we were 25% done with the whole standard being interoperable. And I, and I say that as to not give an impression that there's full interoperability in, in the 3G ARCS uh, standard. Um, we were able to get 14 vendors to link with linking protection uh, and pass analog voice traffic, right? Um, and those links included point to multipoint, point to point, uh, and broadcast links, uh, as well as time broadcasts and time requests, right? So we got about 25% done with that. Uh, there has since been a, an update to the standard uh, that's currently up with NATO right now, so we've kind of put that work on a little bit of pause um, as we move forward. Uh, and, and moving into 2024, bold quest, we're undecided on what capability we're gonna chase. We'd like to finish up the, the 3G uh, ARCS, but uh, that's gonna be dependent on another exercise we have coming up. Uh, the, the Aussie Defense Force Strategic HF uh, was invited to our, our 3G event the HFINA, um, and they said, hey, we, we want to put one on our own, right? So we started working with those guys and looking at capabilities um, that the warfighter needs now. And, and John mentioned Indo-PACOM, right? So we looked at, all right, what, what do our warfighters need in the Indo-PACOM AOR uh, that is going to lead to them being successful? Uh, so we looked at both maritime, we looked at a lot of the ground forces, uh, and we came up with Stanag 5066, um, Edition 3, uh, which is currently being utilized by, uh, you know, multiple uh, maritime and, and naval forces, um, and then kind of expand on our 3G work. We're looking at digital voice, um, and, and for the communicators in the room, you guys know the difference between analog and digital voice. It's sitting there listening to fuzz in your ear, barely being able to to pick out what the uh, the operator on the other end is saying. That's your analog, right? Digital voice is much more clear. It's digitized. It's data. Uh, and, it, and it tends to operate better at, at lower signal to noise ratios, um, kind of in poor channel conditions, right? So that event is set for April 15th through the 19th uh, in Canberra, Australia. Uh, right now we have uh, a, a fairly strong commitment um, from at least, at least 13 vendors uh, that'll be coming out. Um, we gave them kind of options, whether you can do the digital voice or the Stanag 5066. Uh, and for the folks that don't know, I should, probably should explain this first. Stanag 5066 uh, is a way to pass data in an HF link, um, regardless of whether you're in an ALE link or whether you're utilizing uh, you know, single channel fixed frequency, single sideband, uh, be able to pass data. It could be IP, uh, it could be ASCII, uh, multiple other things uh, between HF radios. So it's a, it's a, it's a data standard uh, within the NATO standards. Um, so that's set for April. Uh, what are we going to do for Bold Quest 24? We're not entirely sure yet. Uh, most of it's probably going to be dependent on where that standard uh, for the 3G ARCS ends up in NATO, uh, and also what we're able to proof out uh, in Australia um, in April. Uh, so you've got really a, a small, dedicated, uh, you know, group of folks kind of working at this voluntarily. Uh, the other thing is, the vendors they eat the cost of all this, right? Um, they're not. We're not paying them. Uh, they're paying their own ways to come to these because uh, they have a, a vested interest in obviously selling interoperable products um, to the warfighter, right? Because they want to make money. They're revenue-producing businesses, um, so they want to show that their gear works with uh, with other gear in order to market it that way. All right. So I know I just fed you guys the fire hose. I don't know how much time I have, John, but uh, fed you guys the fire hose on a lot of what we're doing with uh, with interoperability, and there's a, there's a there's a reason for that, right? It's we look at, you know, we, look, we got two folks in uniform here today, right? Just recently retired, 21-year uh, naval communicator. I have a passion for ensuring that our, our warfighters, the guys and the gals that come after me, and, and I know there's a lot of retired folks here in the room as well, they have the capabilities to fight and win, right? That's the most important thing. We can't be putting out gear out there that's not interoperable. Um, and Mass Sergeant, I'm sure you've seen it. Sergeant Major, I'm sure you've seen it, right? We have a huge focus right now, and, and, uh, and the DOD really has uh, kind of a laser, laser focus on HF, right? It's time to strike when the iron's hot, um, and that's why we've been doing this work uh, in order to get it highlighted. As we all know, uh, let's see, somebody's, somebody's taping us here. Are you hooked up to, uh, 
He hooked up to the internet there, taping. All right, let's just say he was, right? Hypothetically, we're running a, a VTC, right? And there's folks online that they're streaming out there, right? Let's say right now we lose all terrestrial communications, all IP-based communications. We lose all SATCOM. Anything beyond line of sight, we lose, right? RJ45 cable is pulled. How are our warfighters and our commanders going to maintain critical C2 and be able to fight and win a war using only one possible way of beyond line of sight that's very prevalent throughout the fleet? And that's IGF. All right, and that's why it's making a, a very large comeback. Um, and it's really one of the only survivable waveforms you know, with inside a, a, a nuclear blast area. Uh, so that's why there's a big, big resurgence. Okay, so I fed you guys the fire hose a lot. I'll, I'll kind of open it up uh, for any questions before we kind of start talking a little bit about the, uh, the architecture development work that, uh, that our team is doing as well. Yes, sir. I'm going to bring you the mic because I can't hear you. Yeah, so John, I know you talked about uh, Pacific Endeavor 23. What, what's on the radar for Pacific Endeavor 24? How do interested uh, parties get involved with that? Okay. Um, getting involved with that, you get a hold of Thomas Grant out, out at the Paycom, into Paycom J6, and he can uh, set you up on how to get involved with that. Um, as far as my involvement goes, that's about it. Uh, I used to be more involved with it, but like I showed you on the, the other side, I'm getting higher up into the international agreements and all that kind of stuff. So it's not so much hands-on anymore, which I'm kind of unhappy about, but I guess that's how life goes. The other part, we've been talking about Indopaycom and so forth, but let's go across to the other side of the world over in Europe. They're heavily involved in um, HF. We, uh, the, there's an HF gateway at Stuttgart. I'm not gonna tell you who owns it. Um, there's also, and it's coming up in March, there's a major NATO exercise called Steadfast Cobalt. And this is the certification of the NATO Rapid Response Force's communications capabilities. And they have just recently started adding HF to their agenda. Uh, we were supposed to play last year. Um, this was, so, but uh, we couldn't get the uh, key strips in time, so that fell through the floor. So it's, it's just not only Indopaycom, there's other things happening in Indopaycom. Uh, PACAF is doing some things which I can't get into. Um, SOCOM is doing a lot around the globe which we can't get into. And like I mentioned, at the federal sector, uh, HF is coming alive. Uh, if you want to look at the documentation, uh, I re ask that you go to the DOD C3I modernization strategy and look at LOE 4.6. Okay, that tells us, tells the DOD that in case of uh, satellite de denied access to come up with a beyond the line of sight capability. And, you know, it's depending upon how, I, how high up on a tower you can get and if you have a set of big eyes, you can, you know, maybe use a skivvy waiver, um, better known as a signalman, uh, to do that. But most cases, it's going to be HF. Um, one thing I forgot to mention on the international agreement side is that we're going to be using P25 on that too, which is part of the LMR radio uh, setup. So we're looking at that as well. Any other questions? Well, enjoy the rest of, oh, we got one. John, I enjoyed your presentation, but also emphasizing the important, the DOD importance emphasized by Brian. Are you seeing the same level of high level interest for commercial HF applications? 
the the level of the for HF usage. For example, uh, denial of service and the elevated importance in the DOD, such that the Secretary of Defense just put out the lead service memorandum to the Navy. Are you sensing uh, in the commercial side of the house a level of an elevation of importance? Do you have any examples? Uh, well, I think about the best example is the vendors, the radio vendors, deciding to, to, to blow up their silos of excellence and work with Brian on getting the radios to be interoperable. You know, it, it's, you know, everybody has their proprietary stuff on the radios, but if I can get Harris and Collins and Barrett and JVC and NEC and da 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 da, da you know, on out to come together to help solve a, a common problem, I think, I think that's speaking highly of trying to get this, you know, at the elevated level. Another driver is that the Five Eyes have this at an elevated level as well. Okay, yes, we have the HFGCS sites. Australia has their um, internal version of HFGCS, okay, within their country, but the idea is, okay, let's bring Canada, the UK, um, and then like I mentioned, NATO is, is now looking at HF because of some of the lessons that they're learning from the Ukraine. Okay, some of those, which we can't get into, are filtering into what Brian's doing and what the HF community at large is doing. I guess where I was after is that military strategy for HF communication uh, is shifting and pivoting and because of the denial of services and et cetera. Is commercial aircraft, is commercial emergency services, are they, because a denial of service for the DOD probably has a similar impact on um, non-military applications. I'm just curious if that demand signals in the commercial industry. So, so, for commercial aircraft. so for commercial aircraft, I haven't seen that. Okay, but I know they have HF because if, you know, if they're traveling in the middle of the country or across the oceans, uh, say going to Europe or somewhere else in the Pacific, the aircraft always has contact and that's got to be HF. I mean, the, the Air Force on a, the 17s, the 52s, the 5s, et cetera, the big heavy transports, they, have all, they all have HF because they have a lot of systems that keep breaking down. So what they do is they use Mars radio and they come up to Mars radio, which is 724, and Mars radio will patch them into a maintenance facility where they talk through whatever problem it is so they can fix whatever broke on the airplane. So I only finished half, so I think I've got you guys for another like 15 minutes. So, but uh, no, as 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 Mr. Reese pointed out, right, the the DoD has taken a, a big shift and pivot. Um, just as of yesterday, the the Deputy of Secretary of Defense uh, has assigned the U.S. Navy as the the lead service for managing HF waveforms, right? So which gets into our our other our other side of our sub working group, the architecture, uh, and also. Uh, the JTNC um, is, is chartered to, to assist uh, lead services with, uh, with managing waveforms. Um, so without getting into too much detail uh, of stuff inside this forum, uh, the JTNC along with uh, the Navy and some other partners are working on a, a DOD HF enterprise architecture solution, right? Um, HF, you know, waveforms, uh, and, and I like to emphasize waveform, right? Because people hear HF and they think of fuzz in your ear, uh, single sideband, single channel. Uh, there, there's a whole family of waveforms uh, within HF um, that the, the JTNC manages the, uh, the DOD IR repository for waveforms. Uh, but there's a whole, there's, there's multiple waveforms, right? And, and, and they're not all designed to be interoperable with each other. Um, so looking at the enterprise architecture solution, right? This is, 
this is a capability that's no different from MUOS, right? It's no different from you know, any other form of SATCOM or any other form of, of ULOS. Uh, HF is a capability, depending on which waveform you're using, right, to add into your toolbox, right? So it's, it, it is, it is complementary to beyond line of sight communications, uh, as well as, you know, as John said, in that DDIL uh, environment, um, it's one of the only survivable uh, waveforms for beyond line of sight communication. Um, so as we, as we start to take a look at shaping that architecture picture, right, um, you know, we, we look at how do our warfighters utilize uh, communications, what, what capabilities we're going to need once we get down to the end of that pennant, right, of where we have, you know, very few capabilities uh, to utilize beyond line of sight. Um, so those are all things that that uh, our team, as, as well as the team that you know, we're partnered with, are looking at as far as capabilities uh, to designing that architecture. And, and, and as we sit in a, in, in a digital age, right, um, everyone's got cell phones. Uh, folks don't like to pick up a, you know, a red phone or, a, or an H250 anymore and talk, right? And we get it, we understand, right? There's, there's better ways to, to pass data and, and to keep logs and keep records. Um, digital HF is the, is the future uh, you know, for, for the DOD and I think for a lot of our partners, as you can see, uh, the, you know, the, the reaction within uh, industry um, in creating capabilities uh, with inside digital HF. All right, that's all I've got. Um, I'll open up to any, any other questions before I pass it back to, uh, to Mr. Holloway. All right, thank you guys very much. Have a great rest of your day.